10. Chris White from England, the touch judge. Larkin tossed the ball away and Spencer wasn't happy with it. The Carlos Spencer fight, I'm interested to hear what, what you might have done differently in that situation again. What I would have done differently? Yeah, like, like you, I don't know. Talk. When you win a fight, do you do something differently? <laughs> <laughs> right, let's jump into it, mate. I'll count us in. Three, two, one. Stephen Larkin, thanks very much for, for joining the podcast. I've been hounding you for a while to jump on. Great to see your face. Yeah, you too, Pete. How's, uh, how's life been treating you of recent times? Uh, not too bad. Over in Ireland now, so coaching with Munster and have gone through the worst period of weather in my life. Um, winter, winter in Ireland is not fun, but we've come out the other side. We're in spring now and we're in the COVID-19 lockdown at the moment, so no rugby, but um, it's been good up until now in terms of rugby. Yeah, we, we're definitely going to jump into Munster chat and get stuck into that. So... Just to kind of set it up, I want to give you a bit of a heads up of what's coming, um, podcast talking points. Um, so everything is a competition, uh, Brumbies and Wallabies chat, uh, a little bit about it, Gregan, and, uh, and also your coaching process, convos, culture, and uh, leadership, and also leading a group of, coach, of, of coaches. So um, that's kind of where we're going to go with it. So, and as I mentioned, the detail's great, so, so go for gold. Um, where I want to start, though, Wallabies, legend, 1999, uh, World Cup win, which was pretty massive. <laughs> Three Australians, golden era. As you know, I sell kicking tees uh, through, through, <laughs> through, through rugby bricks, and you had number 10 on your back, but for some reason they didn't let you kick, so <laughs> why was that? Uh, I was. I was a kicker. I've, I've got a few points from goal kicks, conversions, penalties. But I struggled to practice, so I don't know if you, you're aware, but I had a couple of bad knee injuries uh, around the 99 World Cup, and I couldn't do any training. I did just a load of kicking would flare my knee up. Um, so kind of from 99 onwards, it really limited my um, goal-kicking practice, which yeah. therefore meant I, I wasn't allowed to kick in goals uh, in games except as a backup kicker. Uh, where, do you, where do you think you rank, though, within that group going through? <laughs> Which group are you talking about? Because we had, uh, obviously, when we were playing 99 World Cup, we had uh, Matt Burke, who's regarded, I think, as one of the best goal kickers ever. So I was never really going to get past him. But I was sort of there or thereabouts. You know, I was third or fourth in the team at that stage. I think Joe Roth was ahead of me as well. And then players after that, so Matt Guido and, and Sterling Mortlock, um, sort of went ahead of me um, in both the Brumbies and Wallaby set up. So uh, I, I was, I, I felt I was good enough to kick goals. <laughs> to, um, the, the coach never threw it over to me because I never did the practice. So growing up, I was always a goal kicker. Um, so I was a halfback up until yes. um, senior rugby. And uh, Dad was a builder and he managed to find a pair of goalposts in town, uh, and he brought them out to the farm. We, we grew up on a farm, and uh, I used to practice a lot, so um, I spent a lot of time uh, in the paddocks with my dog playing footy and uh, kicking balls over the posts and, and then just generally kicking in general. Um, and I had a pretty good record as a junior kicker. I felt I was a, a pretty good kicker. Um, I didn't really have anyone who, who taught me, but um, I spent a lot of time uh, kicking on my own. Um, and I felt I probably got the background of goal kicking or how to goal kick from all the tapes that I used to watch. So I was a, I was a dish pig at the AIS, Australian Institute of Sport. Oh, yeah. So, uh, I used to go in there on a Sunday morning for five hours and wash dishes. Um, <laughs> and I was... I don't know, probably from about 17 to um, 22, 21, 22. I, w oh. I was working in, in the kitchen there, maybe a bit earlier than that, maybe 16, um, working in the kitchen there on a Sunday morning for five hours. And uh, uh, after my shift, I'd go into the video library at the AIS. So I had a bit of access because I could, I could get into the kitchen. I, I had a bit of access to other areas of the AIS. And I jumped in the video library there and they had all tapes of 
every sporting event that Australia uh, was involved in. And it was VHS back then, so you'd have to go <laughs> go along the library and find your VHS. And <laughs> all the old, it was the, 80, the 84 Grand Slam Tour and all those old games were there. So I used to go in after work and just watch and wow. uh, pick up ideas and, and, and try and mimic um, you know, a Michael Liner or someone like that, goal kicking. Um, I want to go back to those sessions out in the paddocks. What was what was Dad telling you? What do you remember? Some of those early early messages with your kicking, he was trying to sort out. Dad was never a goal kicking coach, so <laughs> I went out on my own. But uh, on a Saturday morning, I'd wake up pretty early, so we'd play, you know, roughly around one o'clock when we were kids, and I'd have to get up about seven o'clock, go out and do my kicking before we go in, because Dad was always my coach as well. So we'd have a fair bit of setup before the game, so I'd have to get up pretty early practice my goal kicking on game day and then go to the game. Unreal. And you were quite unique with your, your goal kicking. A lot of players you use uh, tees nowadays, like, like the rugby bricks tees. But I want to hear the absolute process. So you, you've got a kick. You're playing for the, the Brumbies. It sounds like you actually got to kick for them. Um, and and the, the sands coming onto the field, what was your process of, of putting the ball on, on the sand heap? Um, well, we did. We, we had different moulds depending on on the year, I guess. It was always sand, right? I wasn't unique. It wasn't like I was the only one using sand. That was the only option that we had back in the day. Um, so we had different moulds. So you, you sort of get your bucket. Um, you, you get into your bucket with a cup or whatever your mould was, and you put it down, and then you just shape the mould of the sand a little bit, and then um not not too dissimilar i guess to you know using the plastic tees these days you had a certain height that you like kicking off and you try and mold the sand into that surely you've kicked the sand before i think i've seen some of your posts that, that show that you <laughs> would be selling a bit of sand as one of your kicking. <laughs> i did have a crack one day more more such to entertain your the conversation we had goes all right actually pretty soft through the foot so i can understand the principle um but for repetition, it's just not the greatest. Um, you mentioned there about playing halfback. You obviously grew up playing halfback. Was there ever a moment for the Wallabies where they you might have had to jump in there, like end of a game or injury? Uh, cut, no, cut no I never had to. I never had to. I don't think it was. I think they always had. So it was, you know, for the majority of my career, it was George Green as half. Yeah. Uh, and the backup for a lot of that was Chris Whitaker. Um so those were two recognised halfbacks, and and I don't think there was a time where we didn't have two specialist halfbacks in the twenty one or twenty two, whatever yeah. back then. No, nah, right. So you you started your your Wallaby career playing fifteen, and then you uh, you got the shoulder tap to move into ten, and uh, I've heard that the coach sort of said to you that he'll give you six games, um, and there was a few doubters and, and commentators saying, no, nah, this isn't going to work. Um, Talk me through what you tried to learn and pick up, and what, what was the plan going in for that first game of? Because because there'll be people listening going, "Shit, I've been thrown into first five. How do I attack this?" Yeah, my first game of playing first five five eight. I don't know what you, what terminology you want to use there. <laughs> playing five eight. Um, my first senior game of playing five eight because when I was a junior, I played. Occasionally, I'd jump into 5'8", but I was more of a halfback. I actually started my career at prop because I was so frustrated that the front rowers wouldn't push in scrum, so I said, get out of there. And I think I've probably played three or four games at prop. Um, ah, that answers the youth gear prop. question that's coming up. <laughs> um, so a little bit a little bit of 5'8 as a junior, um, but I remember getting kicked out of – we had a, a young um, – Sorry, when, when we were young, I had a, a couple of players who were pretty good and 5'8 at the time. Uh, used to kick me out of halfback if I wasn't passing the ball well enough to him. So he'd jump into halfback. And then if I was playing 5'8 and I wasn't doing a good job there, he'd jump back into 5'8. So I got shifted <laughs> around a little bit between 9 and 10. I wasn't a particularly big kid. You know, I'm not big now. Um, I wasn't tall either when I was younger. So... I didn't have a lot of strength, um, so sometimes my pass struggled a bit. I was more of a running nine, um, but I was never really asked to, to play at the senior level um, uh, at 10. Um, so my first game, my first ever game um, in senior footy at 10 was at test level 
Um, oh. So how did I handle it? I was um, I was pretty nonchalant about it. So, so coming from fullback, um, I was pretty comfortable playing fullback at the time. Um, I was competing, I guess, competing pretty heavily against Matt Burke for the Wallaby spot. I wasn't necessarily um, vocal about, you know, trying to get past him or felt that I was better than him. Um, but he was the guy who was in front of me. Um, and I was just um, plotting my course along, you know, knowing one day that I'd get an opportunity at fullback. Uh, and the coach came up to me and said, look, we've, we've got a bit of a deficiency at 10. Do you think you can jump in there? And I said, sure. How do you want me to play? And he said, just play exactly like you're playing at fullback. Um, and I guess, you know, I was a pretty brave fullback. I didn't kick a lot at fullback. I, I ran the ball a fair bit um, in counterattack. I think that was probably contrasting to the way Matt Burke played. He'd always come back and put a contestable up and win that contestable. I'd always come back and just try and chance my arm running. Yeah. So I said, same when you're, when you're at 5'8". So... You know, I jumped in there and my first game was against England. Um, and I think we won 60-odd nil. So it was wow. a pretty good start. Scored three tries and never really looked back from there. They did say, you're right, they did say I had six games to sort of feel my way in there. They'd give me a chance over these next six games to, to see whether the experiment was going to work. But um, yeah. it, kind of, it kind of kicked off straight away with the big victory over England and a couple of good tries. I'm interested to hear the one of the things that I read was there was doubt as there was this isn't going to work. So I guess for for players who have got their own self doubt about having a crack at driving a team and playing ten, did you hear all that noise? No, not really. We were told pretty early on not to listen to the media. Um, <laughs> it was a big part of our culture that wow. um, that uh, media outlets would always. Um, try and twist the story to sensationalise it to to sell papers, right? So don't read anything into it. The, the loss is never as bad as they write and the win is never as good as they write either. So, yeah. uh, no, like I said, I was pretty nonchalant. I was, you know, pretty young, I guess, uh, in my journey to, to, to play in the um, gold jersey. And I guess I was, I was more happy for the opportunity than, than worried about whether I would be good enough or not yeah and, and when you were throwing those cutout balls I was watching some stuff last night how did you get that nice that nice spin on the ball so it almost you know did, did a little dive at the end was that something you, you worked on when you threw your, your big bridge balls and cutout balls so so how, how long did you play 10 for <laughs> I played a long time and I, I, I could definitely master that skill um, right. but it's, it seemed you just you just chose to throw the cutout pass every opportunity you could um <laughs> I had a vision of the outside space. I guess my weakness was probably hitting the short ball. I couldn't, I couldn't see that space in there, but I would, I would definitely identify if there was space on the edge, and we had some pretty talented wingers. So mm. uh, I didn't master that pass, the, the float over the top. That's just the way I passed. <laughs> yeah, no, I read it. Um, it was a big part of your game, and most of the footage, there's heaps of stuff you throw on those long balls. Um, game of the century, 2000. It was replayed on uh, Facebook recently, so a lot of people tuned in and watched that. Um, it was just a, a time where rugby was just at, at its height and incredibly popular. What was it like, sort of, probably looking back now, you can reflect on, shit, that was a, a pretty cool time to be playing uh, rugby for Australia against a lot of names. You guys had a lot of big names, household names. So what was that like during the time? Yeah, it was special. Um, I think we 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 probably – well, it was definitely the golden period of Australian rugby. We won every trophy there was yeah. an Australian rugby player to win. We won it all. Um, and we had a pretty amazing record in terms of win-loss. Um, so it was a special feeling. I think, you know, you, you definitely remember teams or tournaments when you've had success. Um, that sort of adds to the enjoyment factor, definitely. Um, and I think it, it bonds you closer to all the players around you. And, you know, we've got a really strong bond with all of those players still. Um, and 99, we obviously won. And then you're talking about 2000 there where, the game of the century was played against New Zealand, and I'm interesting that it's interesting that you bring it up because New Zealand obviously won that one. So, 
pretty happy with that. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think it was just that it was someone missed know, a cover tackle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't look at the last two minutes of the game. <laughs> um, it was it was just the quality of players that we had around us. I think it was you know it was like I said a golden period of Australian rugby, but it was because we had. I look across the team and and I. I I genuinely thought that every one of those players was the best player in the world. It felt that way. It felt like we could beat any team um, if we just applied ourselves, if we just concentrated, we could score a try, we could beat any team that we wanted to. And it was an amazing feeling, right? It was something that you only get from um, winning close games regularly or winning games regularly or, or knowing that you can come back from any situation on the field through experience. And we just had that. So that game, the result in that game wasn't wasn't fantastic for us, but I think we went on to win the Bledisloe. I'm not sure you probably know those facts, um, <laughs> but we were down, oh, we were down 20 points, 20 odd points in the first seven minutes of the game or something. We came back at half time, we were level, and then it went yeah. right down to the wire. We nearly we nearly won the game with maybe five minutes to go, and then Jonah scores in the corner to win it. So yeah, it was it was an amazing game to be a part of. It was. Um, Obviously, even better to be um, spectating at. You played well, well in it as well. I watched it. Um, a few good decisions and good passes. A few gaps you took. Um, show and go. It was good to see. Um, the <laughs> the Carlos Spencer fight. I'm interested to hear what what you might have done differently <laughs> in that situation again. Um, uh, well, what I would have done differently. Yeah, uh, like you, I don't know. You talk- when you win a fight, do you do something differently? <laughs> <laughs> was, was there anything before, before that moment that, that that led to, or was that just something out of the blue? Uh, no, it's just a rivalry between Australia and New Zealand. Like that. I, I guess growing up, for me, that was always the biggest game. I, I used to go down the club um, where I played, and we'd watch the test matches between Australia and New Zealand, and I remember turning around and, you know, as a young kid, how much of the game do you actually watch? Mm, don't know. You get distracted with everything else. But I certainly remember the emotion in the room and, you know, looking around at all the people and how excited they got and how disappointed they got when we'd lose games and just that emotion. You know, from that moment, I said, I really want to be a part of these games. Look at look at how it affects so many people. Yeah. Um, so... I guess I had that in my blood from an early age. Um, Dad, Dad was a rugby player. Dad played, you know, 300 grade games. He was a he was a back rower, second rower for um, Wests in Canberra. And uh, there's a lot of passion in my blood about sport and rugby in, in particular. And um, you know, after watching those games, it was always a hatred for New Zealand. Um, <laughs> H is probably a, a tough word, but you, you know it was that rivalry that, that they're the team that you got to beat. And for such a long period, there was this aura or stigma around New Zealand that they they were the number one team in the world, and no one can beat them. So I don't know. I have to win everything, right? That's 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 in my DNA. I'm I'm very competitive, and yeah. Um, I guess it was more that fight. If you if you if you're specific about that fight, it wasn't so much about Carlos. It was just that mentality that you know I, I didn't let any New Zealander push me around, and mm. I was probably more buying time. I knew that I'd done the wrong thing, so I could have got penalised. I had the ball. I ran into touch. I didn't have any other options, um, and then I dropped it over the advertising signing, uh, signing and I thought. Um, I could quite easily get pe- penalised here because I've thrown the ball away. He wanted to get the ball so I could take a quick, quick mm-hmm. line out sort of stuff. So I just carried on and tried to make a scene out of it so that maybe the referee would penalise me. And, and, you know, it spilled out over the advertising signage. And, uh, yeah, I, I got in, into a <laughs> position, didn't I? I? I got into a strong position over the top of him and, and uh, a couple of little short jabs to the chin. And yeah. uh, I victorious. I was pretty happy with myself. Shit, the uh, energy in the crowd must have been magic after that moment, being on the <laughs> field. Everyone, will, everyone would have been in, in then. Yeah, well, you know what it's like. I, I guess as a goal kicker, you, you're kind of in the zone most of the time, but the crowd doesn't come into it. You, you kind of hear the roar behind. It's it's probably better when, the, when, when everyone's um, making noise as opposed to one person shouting out. You, you could probably tell me this if you're goal kicking and, and one person just shouts out, everyone else is quiet. It affects you more than if the whole crowd is is booing or cheering you. 
Correct. So I guess, yeah, it was, th- those moments, like there were some amazing games we played. At, I remember we played at the MCG and it was a world record crowd of 109,000 people or something. And, wow. you know, they were away from the from the field because it was the MCG. But the noise was just deafening when we went out there. And it, it definitely gives you a boost. It doesn't intimidate you, but it just gives you a boost knowing that you're at home and you've got all these people supporting you. Yeah. Magic. Um, watching the footage again, and not just that game, but right through, I probably uh, saw again just the influence Gregan had on the game, and we had a great yarn um, recently just about the nines' impact on a game. He was the speed and the, the the passes he was giving you a lot of the time was leading you on and getting you getting you into space. Um, when you look back at the impact he had on your game and, and what he was able to create for you. Um, it's interesting, you know, we said before that I never really read the newspaper articles, but I was very cognizant of George being criticised in the media about how slow his pass was. Um, but for me, whenever I wanted the ball, George would deliver the ball. That's the way, that, that's the feeling I had on the field, that we had a bit of a connection, we had a really good he would listen. He would. He would. He would know when I'm talking to him. Like there's a lot of noise on the ground, particularly in test matches, a lot of people shouting, and obviously the crowd noise and stuff. But we had this real connection where I would say something quite quietly, and he would know it was me, and he'd get the ball to me. And it didn't matter where I was, if I was flat or deep or running on an angle, he just had that ability to get the ball perfectly in front of me. So he was. I mean, he. He was so dedicated to his preparation. He was he was one of the best captains I've had because he would always lead in his preparation and everyone would have to follow with that preparation. So by the time you got to a game, you were super confident because you know you've done your preparation. Um, I think um, like just on that, so that some that, of the yeah, some yeah. of the passings. Some of the passes he was giving you, it almost looked very modern day, like the way that he'd scoot, lead. It was, um, yeah, totally agree. With that, just what you mentioned there, I was, I was going to ask, on the field, what value did he add um, in huddles, um, half-time chats? Yeah, I, I don't think we had the tradition. Well, we didn't have huddles as you probably see some of the huddles today where – you know, there's a real concentration, and one guy talking and all that sort of stuff. I think it was um, it was more in and around the game. Um, we'd kind of have little chats between the two of us as the game went on. There was there was I don't really remember those big huddles. Obviously, after a try was scored, you'd come in, but you know, I was probably one of those players that didn't listen in those huddles. I never really had my concentration because I was thinking about what I had to do next, um, or or maybe thinking about what I'd done previously um, but we would have we would have lots of um, chats throughout the game just the two of us and that would give me so much confidence I think it was not just George the beauty of George I guess is that he he was so consistent in what he did he would give you confidence that you knew even if I was having a bad game or someone else was having a bad game I'd look over to George and I'd go okay he's giving me confidence because he's going to just deliver the ball he's going to do his job 99.9% of the time he's going to do his job. He's going to get his kicks away. He's going to run when he needs to. He's going to, kick. He's going to make his tackles. He's going to pass the ball. So that gives you a lot of confidence as a player, knowing that he is so consistent. And I had players like that around me. So it wasn't just George. It was like a Tim Horan or a Rod K from the outside. And then there's some special players on the wing, like I probably just mentioned Ben Tune and, and Joe Roth. That would give me confidence, particularly Joe. Like I look back on Joe's career and he – he just had this ability to finish, you know, top try scorer in Super Rugby for a couple of years. But um, his ability to beat a man one on one, or even uh, beat two guys two on one, um, and and finish opportunities big, strong, powerful. Having those guys just gives you a lot of confidence. So um, there are times, obviously, where you're not having a great game. I don't remember a lot of those games. I don't remember games where. Oh, that's just a terrible game. Everything went wrong. I, I might make one or two mistakes, but I constantly look around at these other guys and go, "They're going to, they're going to do something amazing here. It's not going to come down to that mistake that I made." 
and last sort of question around this this group. You said before that you genuinely felt within all the players in your team that you guys were world class and some of the best players in, in the world. How did how did you get to that stage? And then how did how how did that confidence come through on the field? Like why why did that happen? Why did that group assemble the way that it did in those real golden years? Um, I think it's that. I think it's that consistency of preparation that we we felt. Like we worked really hard, we were super fit, and we we worked really hard on our fitness. And was the coaching good? I guess you know there were there were. I remember a lot of fitness work, um, which gives you confidence on the field that you can basically do whatever your brain tells you to to do. You can basically do because you're fit enough to to do it. Um, and then we had pretty good skill set, but then. It's that confidence of knowing that that guy is going to do something amazing or that guy is going to do something amazing. Mm. So combine all that together with then the experience of coming from behind and winning games or closing out tight games. And over time, that just, I guess it seeps into your memory bank and your experience levels and you become a far more confident player. Yeah. And you get that feeling that it doesn't matter what situation is is presented in front of you, you're going to be able to find a way to win the game. And I, and I want to see that with, you know, if you look at New Zealand's run, and, and I know you'll love me talking about New Zealand, but if, if you look at New Zealand's run where, um, you know, they had so many games undefeated, there were a number of games there that were really tight wins. But that gives them confidence then to go on maybe they've had three good, really tight wins. The fourth, the fourth game that becomes tight, They've got this confidence because we've done it before. We've done it three times before. So you know when you're out on the field, we've yeah. done it before. We can do it again. Yeah. Totally rate it. Um, we're going to go into some Munster chat. Um, I've seen some stuff online. Looking good in the new Red Adidas kit. How are you, enjoy, how are you enjoying it? Uh, it's good. It's, it's been really good actually working with the coaches. So Johan... Um, it's put a really good program together, um, very organised and structured and, and, a, and an amazing head coach slash director of rugby. Um, and then the other coaches, JP Ferreira and Graham Roundtree, doing fantastic jobs. So JP's defence coach and Graham sort of doing a bit of everything, um, breakdown, forwards play, forwards carry, um, you know, the attack inside the 22. So he's he's moulding to everything that we ask him to do. But they're great characters. And we've got a really good bond, I feel, uh, amongst the, the coaching group, a really um, different approach from, from each coach. And I think it's working quite well. Um, so that, that combination's working well to start with. Um, so the environment is, is comfortable there from a coaching perspective. And then we've got some good players, right? We've got some amazing players. When, when we first got here, we had the World Cup on. So we'd, we'd um, been playing without the international players and we sort of had 10 to 12 international players who weren't in the squad. And the guys that were playing whilst those guys weren't there were doing an amazing job and we were learning week to week and getting better week to week. And then we'd get this influx of international players back in. So there's really good depth in the squad, about 45 in the squad at the moment. Um, and, and guys who are sort of pushing when those international players came back into the team, the guys who'd been there playing were actually pushing um, the international players to a point where it was really difficult to not pick the guys who'd been there before. Um, just with, and, um, I think. Just with your, because you're obviously running a lot of a lot of the attack there. I think um, some real insight that I'm I'm keen on is you obviously come from coaching internationally, and then you head jump on a plane and, and head over there, and now you've got to present uh, an attack plan on and what sort of philosophy you want to bring. How do you do that? And I want to sort of hear like how do you present it um, and, and talk to the group and get the messaging across. Is this because? We were we were working together, and you, you knew that we sort of ran things off one another a little bit. <laughs> I'm just interested to hear your story. <laughs> um, it's it's a bit of conversation with Johan. Obviously, that was the first conversation that I had before deciding to come over to Munster, or even before talking to anyone else at Munster, was a conversation with Johan, and then it was a, an interview for the job, 
and in that interview it was um, obviously taking a little bit of what Johan's philosophy was um, and then taking my own ideas and meshing them together and then presenting that um, obviously as my own concept and then from there there was probably a two-month period, maybe a month and a half period before it actually got over there. So it was back and forth with Johan just trying to finalise and um, nut out uh, every aspect of the attack. And then I came in and just presented bit by bit. So um, the first day was really just sort of introducing who I was and presenting my rough overall philosophy on attack or the way that I wanted Munster to play. And then Have you got some examples um, or just of that without giving too much away? Roughly, it's just playing with momentum. So if we haven't got momentum, we don't really want to be putting ourselves under pressure by continuing to hold on to the ball. It's as simple as that, that we don't want to muck around with the ball when when the opposition are now in a dominant position. Yeah. And, and things sort of grew from there, and there's obviously different aspects of attack, the set-piece attack, the counter-attack, turnover attack, all that sort of stuff, and that was implemented slowly um, after that period, and and I think um, the challenge, like I said before, the challenge, or what I was going to jump into before you really interrupted me, <laughs> because we play this European competition, they've got the Six Nations, they had the World Cup, we've got these players coming in and out of the team all the time, and we'd we'd spent the first part of the season really getting everyone up to up to pace with our set piece plays, our our patterns, um, how we want to play our multi-phase, our counter-attack, all that sort of stuff. And then the internationals come back in and we found ourselves as coaches going through that whole cycle again of trying to implement all this new stuff again. Um, but it just happens gradually. You can't expect guys to take too much on board straight away. So we, we, we drip-fed it in, made sure that we, we prioritised what we needed to prioritise so that by the start of the season we were ready to play um, not necessarily our best game, but, but but we were ready to play. We had enough tools to play the game that we wanted to play. And for you, for you as a coach, obviously spending a lot of time in Australia, what was the the things you kind of noticed of um, heading there and just seeing a different emphasis on a different part of the game, or what were some of the things you've you've noticed? I think coming out of the Australian system, there, you know, the, the mix between kicking and ball in hand wasn't good there was no real balance there um, and coming over here you have to get that balance because conditions like I said at the start of this chat um, I've come through the worst winter I've ever been a part of um, we, we like four hours of sunlight a day and um, rain is coming sideways and the wind is non-stop so you've got those conditions and we've played in three games now where the wind has just been unbelievable coming into your face in one half and behind your back in the second where you try and put a kick into it in the first half and the best kicker on your team, he might be able to make, you throw it back to him, he kicks over the ruck, you might be able to make 10 metres if you're lucky. So wow. you've got to come up with different ways to kick. But at the same time, because the ball's wet, you don't want to hold the ball for too long. So that balance, that real balance of how do you play wet, windy conditions um, has come into my attacking philosophy now. Um, Okay, I'm going to hit you, with, hit you with a question and interrupt you again. You're playing into a massive headwind, wet conditions. What's the message uh, you're receiving a kickoff? What's the message to the boys of how we're going to advance the ball forward and get momentum? Okay, I'll give you an example. So we're playing at Thorman Park, um, and the wind's the wind's not actually coming down the field, but it's it's swirling a little bit around because it's it's a it's a westerly. Um, so it's coming off the Atlantic there into the into the stands. It's hitting, um, it's hitting one stand. It's it's bouncing off that stand and it's coming across the field. So the the on the field, if you're on the left hand side, say we're running south, if you're on the left hand side of the field here, you're actually feeling a little bit of wind coming into you, but you're also feeling when that ball gets up, the wind is pushing it straight across the field. Then you get to the other side of the field. There's no wind. You're feeling no wind over there. So there's probably a 10-metre gap down that, that right edge where there's wow. no wind. And you put the ball in the air and you can, you can see that the ball's actually getting blown back over your head, but on the ground it's good. So what do we want to do? We just work the ball to that right edge. So that confidence and the ability to work the ball to one sideline that might be a bit better 
um, is something that we'll work pretty hard on. And then how do we work down that sideline? So how do we hold the ball down that sideline? Or how do we get a kick away down that sideline that's not in the air now, but we still keep that pressure on the opposition? So there are times, you know, the, the general philosophy of trying trying to play whenever we've got momentum or whenever the defence is not set, sometimes you have to adapt that, look, we're going to have to play slowly here to get to the other side. The defence is going to be set, but we have to grind our way through that. Yeah, perfect. And I want to pick up on something we have spoken about before. And also we, we just touched on it with, with Gregan about the impact of the nines in the in the game now. And I know that you've spoken with your nines around how much of an impact they're actually having. Um, yeah. Can you sort of explain what, what, what convos you've been having with them in your tens? Uh, yeah, it's just when they control the game, I guess. Um, so as a 10, I, I never really felt that um, I had to control the game. I, I, I didn't think that from a coaching perspective, the coaches um, gave me scenarios that said, you've got to control the game in this aspect, in this aspect of the game. This, this is a part of the game where you have to control it. But I, I felt I really I had a good sense of knowing when we probably lost a bit of momentum and I'd just get a kick away. Now, I was a pretty ugly kicker of the ball, as you know. Correct. Um, and some of those kicks weren't good, particularly if you, if you watch the 99 World Cup final. Some of those kicks are terrible. But the fact is we had a really good defence, so just get it down the field somewhere and then back your defence, wait for an opportunity and get it back. Right? That's the philosophy. So what we're working on over here is just identifying those situations where a 10 can actually take control. So I guess instilling that, that, you know, we've lost a little bit of momentum now. So the 10 to be able to recognise that we've lost that momentum and how does he then organise the team into some some sort of a, a kick? Because I think defences are a little bit better now than, say, compared to 99. Um, they've got a more structured backfield. Their counter-attack's a little bit more dangerous. So you can't just willy-nilly kick the ball downfield straight to their fullback who brings the ball back. So you've got to be a little bit smarter in organising your kick. So that's where your 10 would maybe come in and, and say, OK, we're going to go to this kick formation. And there'd be other, other situations, I guess, when you're closer to the line. We've got a couple of different attacking patterns when you're closer to the line. That ability for the nine now to control the play. So he just picks whichever side he wants to run, for example, and everyone's got to expect him um, to run on his on their side and, and be ready for that. Um, yeah. So, so little things like that. There's obviously a few more scenarios where the nine could take control versus the ten, but um, but there's a couple of examples for you. I, I think um, as well, whenever you like that, having played ten myself, if the coach is now saying, "Cool, you and the nine are sharing the load and sharing the workload of of attacking systems and whatnot," it's a it's a bit of a load off, which is great. Um, I want to talk about everything as a competition. And you've got to think uh, in your head of some examples of this not on the field. Um, I think there's a lot of examples of, of you being competitive playing rugby. But I want to hear about any Wallaby trips away where <laughs> everything's a competition and anything can be a competition. Because I've heard you say that line, so it's obviously pretty important to you. Yeah, Wallaby trips away off the field? <laughs> yeah, or just any, any yeah, example. Right I, I think any... <laughs> any time that there's, I guess you go out playing golf, like you, you, anything goes right on the golf course when you're playing golf with your mates from rugby, like ripping the Velcro off your glove or putting <laughs> the golf cart into reverse just before they're taking a shot. <laughs> um, all of that comes into play and, and there's nothing's off limits, really. You can do anything there. And as much tongue-in-cheek as you have on, say, the golf course, at the, end of the, at the end of the game, you're still desperate to have won the game. So you think, oh, it's just jovial, but it's not. It's serious. <laughs> I, think, I think that was, if I just look back to 99, I know I'm, I'm harping back to uh, an era that doesn't really matter anymore, but we had players who were super competitive. Like, all of them were super competitive. Dan Herbert could not lose at anything. We play board games like randomly, occasionally, maybe once a year, and he could not lose that board game. Or we'd play video games, and and a Matt Cobain would be there practicing till two o'clock in the morning, so the next day he could actually beat someone on the game. There was <laughs> there was that competitive edge through the whole team, and I think that was also something that set us apart from other teams. Um, 
I think what you're referring to is, is our game of pool where you'd luckily beat because <laughs> accidentally sunk the black. Is that, the, is that what you're trying to get through here? That's one example, plus the game of kick golf and many goal kicking competitions we had before training. So um, although I do think you're a competitive guy, it often doesn't mean you get the, get the win. But I do have a question. Do you think that that's contagious? So that competitiveness, because I, I think it's so good for a team. If, if everyone's just, oh, I'm not too worried about winning this little thing, it, that can be contagious. But the other it, way... Yeah, I think everything's, well, everything's contagious from whoever's leading your team. So everyone will get influenced by leaders. So if, you're, if you've got a coach, you'll get influenced by that coach. If you've got a captain, you'll get influenced by that captain to some extent, right? Some people will get influenced bigger than other people. But if you've got a leader, so a coach or a captain or a senior player who is super competitive, then that will rub off on you and you'll want to be a little bit like him because there's always that imitation of your leaders. Yeah, great great example. And I, that takes me into sort of the, the leading a, a coaching group. Um, before we jump into that, have you found any of those stupid escape rooms over where you're living now in Ireland? <laughs> We, no, not in Ireland yet, no. But we, we have done one as a coaching group, yes, and it was good fun and it was um, oh, the poor guy. Actually, it was good for our psyche going into a game. We won the game quite convincingly the next day and I think it was because we did the escape room the night before. I'll let you explain very quickly what an escape room is. Uh, for the people that don't know, um, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's basically a set of puzzles. You get locked in a room with a set of puzzles and, and often there's a sequence to the puzzles and you've got to work your way through the puzzles to escape from the room. And it might be in some of them, some of the good ones and, and um, the more enjoyable ones are where you unlock a padlock on a cabinet and that cabinet opens up and all of a sudden it's a little pathway or a, a, a little tunnel into another room and then all of a sudden you're in another room, you've got to get out of that room as well. So I enjoy them. You obviously don't, but um, again, it's, I think that's probably what you, you're alluding to before, that competitiveness off the field. Yes, yeah, totally agree. So currently you're a part of a coaching group and you're, you're playing with the rugby side an assistant sort of coach role. You're doing the attack, but as, as an assistant coach. So um, throughout your career, what are some key things and learnings with how to add value as an assistant coach? Uh, well, you've got to be very well aligned with the head coach to start with. So there's got to be a, a good vision in place from the head coach and, and the way that you want to play the game. And then um, I think it, it comes down to communication, making sure that um, you're communicating firstly with your head coach, that, that uh, you have regular discussions about changes to the program or anything like that. And then uh, when you're presenting to the team, you've got to get the buy-in from the players. And, and to do that, um, there are various ways to do that. I guess you can, you might be lucky and get the buy-in straight away because it's something new and it's something exciting for everyone. Other times you might have to get the senior players uh, involved and talk to them first and get their buy-in and then that can transfer into the team. Or the next level would be there's one player that just doesn't, doesn't get it or doesn't want to buy in, then you'd have to have a one-on-one -on -one with that player to, to see if he really um, understands what you're trying to achieve and whether he's got a better idea or, or whether you can just convince him that this is the way that we need to do it. Um, but that's the challenge, I think, as an assistant coach, making sure your head coach is, is on board and then um, trying to, to give your vision or present your vision to the team so that everyone gets on board. Yeah. So obviously before you present your vision to the team, you've already ran it past the head coach and coaching group got the green light. Also being a head coach role, you've had a lot of success as well. Some of the things you you probably missed at the start and didn't do as well and then your learnings and some things you did really well by the end of it. Uh, yeah, I think, I, I think the biggest challenge for me when I first started was um, allowing other people to do their work to do their job. Um, so I had a really good, okay, thinking back to the Brumbies, really good setup there with a head of S&C and, and head of medical who were pretty much autonomous. They did a really good job. They came up with new ideas, innovation, and it worked really well. I didn't have to look over their shoulder. But then there's been coaches that I've been reluctant to allow control 
of the team with. Um, mm. So I, I think my learnings are just making sure that all the coaches are on the same page first and then just being a little bit more comf- comfortable letting other coaches um, run certain aspects of the team. So the challenge for me when I was head coach at the Brumbies, I was head coach and I was also um, attack coach and I was also backs coach. So I was, I was doing all three things partly because I didn't trust anyone else to do it and partly because I, at the time I thought I could do all jobs efficiently and, and in hindsight you can't. You can't do that many jobs efficiently. Yeah. You know, I think um, not everyone gets to experience what a super rugby environment is like. Um, so I guess I want an example of your probably the days at the Brumbies. This is a challenge for you to remember this. But you play a game on said day, um, and I, I kind of want to hear as a coaching group, what is the review process? What do you do personally as the head coach, um, sort of leading up until that very first meeting with the, with the playing group? Um, what is the background stuff that happens? Uh, so it's a fair bit of work on Sunday. So finish the game generally late on a Saturday night, and then as a coach, um, you will you will get into a fair bit of work on a Sunday. Um, we, we've generally previewed the opposition uh, the the week before, so maybe the Friday or the Thursday. We've we've done a little bit of homework on the opposition, um, but that review again happens on a Sunday as a coach. So. There's a combination of um, previewing the opposition and reviewing your last game, and you're trying to tie in the clips from your last game to make sure they're relevant for the game that's coming up. For example, if you've got a set-piece play that you ran specifically for the opposition on Saturday night, there's not a lot of point reviewing that one if it's not relevant to the game this week. Um, Mm. Unless you just want a bit of closure, you know, we, we planned on doing this, um, we ran it in the game and then we come out of that with a bit of closure on the Monday and say we didn't quite achieve what we wanted to achieve. So look at our process, we have to do it better or something like that. But you've got to be, you've got to be pairing up what you're doing on a Sunday with your next game. So a lot of work for a coach on a Sunday, unfortunately. It's not how, many, how many hours are we talking? When I first started, I'd be 12 hours. It was ridiculous. Um, wow. Just I had no idea what I, what I was doing. Um, probably a little bit more efficient now, down to four or five hours. Yeah. on a Sunday, making sure everything's syncing up nicely and then talking to everyone as well, um, so talking to the other coaches and then you're talking to some players as well. So, you know, the ideal situation is that you've got some players involved in the review process. Well, quite often the, the question coaches get asked you is, hey, what, what have you got for me? What are my work-ons? And if you've got a, a team of 23 um, plus you're doing your team review, 12 hours of work, how much time are you allocating to a player? like I'm doing a review on your performance? It's difficult, yeah. You've got to spend a little bit more time to get the individual stuff. So we generally would put the individual reviews on a Wednesday, which gives you just enough time. So I schedule those in for a Wednesday afternoon and you spend the Wednesday morning because Monday, Tuesdays are very hectic as a coach. You've got the review meetings and then you're doing preview meetings and you've got sessions on the field plus gym sessions. Really, Wednesday is your only time to then revisit the game again. My review process with the backs, for, for, for instance, would be quite complete. I'd, I'd look at the whole game. I'd look at pretty much every aspect of the game from attack and defence point of view. And in that review, you'd generally pick up things that were good or things that were poor. So the players would, would have a, a bit of a feel for what they need to do anyway on the Monday mm. and just reaffirm that on the Wednesday with their individual meetings. And, and I've kind of got two more questions around this. So with with that, that's all very rugby and very um, work. With the coaching group, you obviously want to have a good vibe. You guys are a, a mini team. What were some of the things that you guys did to have a good co- coaching culture, if you can remember back? Did you, did you make them all do escape rooms with you? Or? <laughs> Occasionally we'd do escape rooms, yeah. Um, just vary it up. So we had... We had a dance challenge that we'd put to the players, an Olympics, a lip sync challenge with the players, and the coaches would have to form a group. So there is a little bit of footage floating around of me and the other coaches dancing really badly. <laughs> uh, so, so little things like that would probably bring us together. We wouldn't do that regularly. It definitely wouldn't be a regular thing. Um, we'd, we'd try and catch up uh, as a staff, as a you know, particularly when we toured. We go out for dinner on the Friday night as a group and encourage coaches, or sort of on a Wednesday or a Tuesday night, to go out together and, and just do something a little bit different. 
but your time is like it's amazing when you come out of playing into coaching how little time you have you uh you kind of have it easy as a player you're in you can you can switch on for the period that you're at training and then when you get home you can really switch off but as a coach sometimes that's very hard to do yeah and um your, your, your process uh, when dropping a player, you've probably got better at this as you've gone along as well. Like, have you got um, some sort of rules for yourself around dropping a player that's not too brutal or the right way and the wrong way? Uh, it's something that you have to talk to the whole team about at the start of the year. I think that's very important that there's going to be disappointment throughout the year for individual players. Um, Maybe an understanding from everyone that there is a rotation system if that's what you're using or that you have to, um, that you have difficult um, situations where it's a 50 50 and you're going on a gut feel. You, 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 you explain that up front to the whole team. And then the best process is obviously getting to the player as soon as possible, letting them know the reasons and being really honest with them um, that they'll quickly find out if you're not being honest with them. Um, and, and honesty might come down to, listen, it was 50-50, um, you're a better attacker, he's a better defender. I think defence is going to play a bigger part in this game, so we're going to rotate you out this week. Um, and you, generally, if you talk to the player one-on-one, um, before you talk to the bigger group, uh, they're a little bit more cushioned to the impact that the meeting might have on them. Uh, and then you, you also open up the opportunity for them to have uh, a further discussion um, about what they need to do here or there to get back into the team or to regularly start in the team. Yeah. Cool, man. And and probably just the last thing I want to wrap up with is just when things don't go go well or go your way, your last job finished up pretty quick and um, everyone has to deal with a losing season or a shit season or, a, right, what the hell am I going to do next sort of moment. Um how did you kind of get yourself back up and say, right, no, I'm good at this and, and I'm keen to go again? Yeah, well, I kind of went through um, a situation with Christian Lilofano when um, he was diagnosed with cancer. Um, it was very difficult on um, him personally, his family, um, me personally, um, my family, the club, the community. There were a lot of different aspects to that and there was a lot of stress associated with it. Um, probably no more stress than what Christian had to go through himself. I think he was, you know, the uncertainty of what would lie ahead was very stressful. Mm. But everyone through that period was was stressed in some way and the thing I told him was, you can only control what you can control. So don't worry about it. I've used it with the players since. I've, I've, I've kind of used it in team meetings before games where players would be a little bit anxious about, you know, um, I'm a bit nervous going into this game. Well, why are you nervous? Because what if I make this mistake or what if I do that? And, and you go through that process with enough people and you talk to enough people about it and you realise that they're worried about things that haven't even happened yet. And they might not ever happen. So control what you control. Forget about the things that might happen or um, could happen and, and focus on your process. And I guess that's, for me, that's what got, through, got me through that period is um, did th- those thoughts constantly come through your mind about, oh, what if I don't get a job or what if, um, what if someone thinks, thinks of me like that now? You forget about all of that sort of stuff and you just get into your process and say, okay, well, I need to get a job, so what do I need to do? I need to do this. Okay, I'm actually in a current job. What's my current role in my job? I better do that as well. So you try and keep continually push these thoughts out of your head so that you keep your focus on where you're going. Mm. Great advice, mate. And one thing I've definitely learned from you is when you're all in, you're all in. So um pleased to hear it's going well that's all i've got for you mate you did well getting through that it's uh a lot of people say you don't say much but from my, my experience you've been um uh, you've been class and i guess i just want to sort of say thanks for your help along the way as well you've been great so thanks for being on the podcast mate all right thanks pete good luck with your um coaching career as well hopefully it uh kicks off soon as soon as this uh pandemic ends hey awesome man take it easy all right